Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ on this podcast uh, for Proper 8, Luke 9, 51 to 62, where we have the first travel notice and then Jesus is rejected in Samaria. And really what we have are two texts, and let's look at that to start with. I, I have, as I've been doing for the podcast I've done so far, a little outline from the commentary. There wasn't a good one for the second part of this text, so I just have it for the first part. But here's what I want you to see, that the first part of this text has to do with the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and then the second part has to do with conditions on a pilgrimage. So you really have two different texts, but they're related by this notion of pilgrimage, the, the notion of journey, which is a huge Christian theme. I, I'm very much taken with that because of Luke's gospel as being a journey to Jerusalem. But I'm also taken by it by my own life, having done a pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela, you know, this Camino, some of you have heard of it. And, and the idea that they're, they're, life itself is a journey. The, the Christians, early Christians, were called the way, the Camino, the journey. The, the, you know, I mean, so we're, we're always on trek, and Jesus is always on trek. And we are a wandering people of God, like the people of God in the wilderness. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm going to go right to the Greek text, because I don't think this, um, this outline is all that you know, um, interesting. And in doing so, I want to I point out the journey language because it's just all over the place here. It's this word that is a technical term in Luke, poreomai. You've probably heard this from me before. But look at how many times it's used here. Verse 51, which is the turning point in Luke. Here they're journeying. Here they're journeying to Jerusalem. And then it ends with him journeying. And notice that the next text starts with him journeying. So if you can't see that your theme for this, this text is pilgrimage, journey, I, I can't help you. It's just all over the place. Now, I, I, I'm not, you know, unique in highlighting the fact that this is the turning point in Jerusalem. We go from Galilee to the journey to Jerusalem. And it's a journey. Jesus is on a journey. Now, most scholars consider this to be some time, this turning to face to go to Jerusalem, in October or November of the year 29, near the Feast of Tabernacles, which is when the Transfiguration occurred. And Jesus will arrive in Jerusalem, 1928, in, um, in March of 29. Okay, Palm Sunday is probably in March, maybe April. You know, the, the, the latest date, and I don't know how accurate this is anymore, for the, the crucifixion is April 7th. So take that for what it's worth. Anyway, um, there are other travel notices along the way, 1322, 1711. But this is the big one. This is where he turns his face to go to Jerusalem. And when you, when you look at this carefully, what you see here is this, this language of when the days were fulfilled. So notice the language of fulfillment here. Of his analepsios. Now, this is very similar to the word exodus in 931. This is his, his lifting up. And really what it's a, a reference to, and some of you have seen this from me, it's that journey of Jesus down from heaven. This is, the, this is the Nicene Creed. He comes from heaven, you know, through the cross, buried in the tomb, and then his reversal here back to heaven. That's what this word, just like Exodus, refers to. It's his departure that includes his invasion into this world, buried in the earth, and then his return to heaven. And it's obviously a reference to the fact that he is going to be crucified in Jerusalem. There is the, there is the atonement. 
And, and here's the technical t to journey to Jerusalem. There's the technical. And he turns his face. You know, and there you really get a sense of Jesus kind of making his direction there. And in 9, 1 to 6, we see him sending the 12. And then in the next pericope that we're going to study, and it's the next pericope in the, in, the, in the gospel too, we see him sending the 70. But here he is sending messengers before his face, journeying into every, here's Samaria, we're in Samaria. So this is sort of ascending too. We don't talk about it as much as ascending because it's not as, you know, these are the, the two major ones. But this is ascending. And what's so interesting is that they reject him. Here again is another sort of reference to Jesus' rejection that will culminate on the cross. And why are they rejecting him? Because he has turned his face to journey into Jerusalem. The journey, the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, is the reason for his rejection. And it's an amazing, it's an amazing moment, if you think about it, that, you know, just the fact that he's going. Now, the, the, here I think you might want to discover, through commentaries, the Samaritan issues. They have their own temple, you know. They have their own, you know, gospels. So there's a kind of a, they have their own religion, and there's, there's, a, there's this tension between Samaria and Ju Judea, and, you know, it obviously goes the other way. The Good Samaritan, which is, is coming up in um, Luke 10 after the, the sending of the 70. I mean, the Samaritans are a big topic in, in Luke. You know, here you have him in Samaria. Um, there is also this important little moment where James and John, these are the sons of Zebedee. I don't think it's a bad idea to talk about them so people know. James, of course, is the one who was martyred in Acts 12. He, these are the part of the big three with Peter. So in Acts 12, he's the first apostle to be martyred. Stephen, of course, is the first martyr, but the first apostle is James. This is the one in Santiago where pilgrimage is now, you know, so this is the, the Spanish Santiago. And this is, of course, the, uh, uh, the evangelist. And, and you can see they get it all wrong. You know, they want to cast fire, you know, from heaven. There's fire. I put it in purple. They want to cast our Lord. Do you wish that we speak fire to come down from heaven and destroy them? You know, and again, here is another place for the cross. The fire, of course, is the fire of God's wrath against sin. And they, like you see with John the Baptist's disciples in Luke 7, they, wanna, they, wanna, they want the wrath of God, the fire of God, to be against the enemies of God. And Jesus rebukes them. Where is it? Here, sorry. Rebukes them. Let me cross that out. He rebukes them here. Because this fire is not upon the enemies of God, it's going to be on the cross. There the fire of God's wrath is going to destroy Jesus because he is the sin bearer. And that is the point of the journey to Jerusalem. That is why these verses are so important. You know? And, uh, you know, the, it ends in a kind of a simple way. They journey into another village. Now, you could almost preach only on this text. You've got the cross here. Um, you've got the rejection here, the cross. And with the fire and Jesus' rebuke, you've got the cross. This is loaded with references to the atonement that's going to take place in Jerusalem. Okay, that's the first part of the text. And this sort of sets the stage. Now you have the conditions for pilgrimage. And what happens to somebody who is, um, is following Jesus? And here is the language of, of pilgrimage. You know, follow me. Follow me. Fo follow you. But while he is journeying on the way, there's that technical term for way. Camino. Okay, Hadas, preparing the way of the Lord. 
Um, what you have here is, is the, 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 um, the, the TIS, somebody, saying to him, we're going to follow you wherever you go, you know? I mean, this is an earnest would-be disciple. And here, here Jesus talks about, and I love this passage. It's one that we cite all the time, you know. Um, the Son of Man having nowhere to lay his head. The birds of the air do, the foxes do, have their places, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He, here you can see the notion of Jesus as the stranger, as the alien. I, I did a lot of work on this in Luke's Gospel in 2417. Are you the only stranger or alien in this world that does not know what has happened? Jesus has no home in this world. And here, again, you have that Jesus coming in. He's an alien coming from heaven into the earth and then going back. But while he's here, he, he is without a home. And, and one of the questions, and this is, a, this is something worth preaching on, is the question of hospitality to the stranger. In a, in a way, that's what Emmaus is about. Are you going to show hospitality to this stranger? Are you going to invite him into your house? And you know what people did to Jesus in terms of the hospitality they showed him, you know, before Emmaus. They killed him. That's the hospitality they showed this stranger, you know. And he's, he's, he's a, a son of man who has nowhere to lay his head. I think we have to think carefully about the strangers, the aliens. You know, in many ways you could say the refugees who are in our midst. Jesus is a refugee. I mean, uh, this isn't in Luke's Gospel, but in Matthew's Gospel. He's a refugee in Egypt. He's really a refugee in this world. He is a stranger. And, and how do we receive him? Again, this is a, another opportunity to preach the cross. You know. One way they showed hospitality to him was killing him. Now, how do we receive him? How do we welcome the stranger in our midst? Um, Jesus then says to another one, follow me. And here, whoops, you can see the, 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 nat the nature here that there are some things that people are, are you know, not you know, willing to do. They're not willing to give, give up things. Here's, again, another Another reference here to follow, you know, the discipleship. And one of the, the, the great themes here at the end is that those who are going to follow him are going to be involved in proclaiming his fit for the kingdom of God. And if you follow him, you got to leave everything behind. You know, I, I love the one of hands on the plow. You got to keep your hands on the plow. You don't want to take your eye off the prize, so to speak. You don't, you don't want to lose sight of your destiny. Keep your hands on the plow in order to follow him, or you're not fit for the kingdom of God. And I, I always think when I'm thinking of the kingdom of God, I'm thinking that there's a king, and his crown is a crown of thorns as he is coronated on the cross. And this is going to prepare for the preaching of the kingdom that's going to come in the next text in Luke 10, 1 to 20, with the sending of the 70. But you really have a sense here, you know, let the bed, let dairy their bed, you know, here's the language for preaching, you know, and you depart, preach the kingdom of God. You know, people are making up excuses not to be disciples, and Jesus is telling them, that to be a disciple, you've got to leave everything behind. And, you know, this, this is the nature of faith, is it not? This is the nature of trust. And this is a, a, a good thing to be talking about at this point. Now, I, I mentioned last time that, that you have in chapter 8, uh, uh, this is what, Pericope 8. So in, in Pericope 7, you have, you know, that strong emphasis on the demons. And then in Pericope 9, this text here, 
I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And in a way, in this little sermon series, in, in, in uh, proper eight, you have this Samaria. But I think this is the text between these two demons where you have the strongest statement of the, the cross. And it's all over the place, really. And what you have here is that those who follow Jesus must, you know, leave everything behind to follow him, to be his disciple. It's not, there, there it is. Leave everything behind. And as I was saying a minute ago, this is the nature of faith. And it's what we struggle with our whole lives, whether or not we have faith to just completely kind of trust in Jesus, to just say, okay, we're going to follow you wherever you go. We're going to make that journey. And that journey is a journey to Jerusalem, even now. It's a journey into suffering. It's a journey into the cruciform life. It's a journey into a life in which we are going to bear the cross by bearing witness to the fact that we are joined and have communion with the crucified one. Um, we live in a culture where it's going to be more and more difficult to do this. We live in a culture where to confess Jesus and to confess the cross, to follow him, to journey with him, to be his disciple, we're going to be persecuted. And I think this is a, a, a lesson, proper eight, this, this rejection in Samaria and this language of, of pilgrimage is an opportunity for us to, to kind of step back and look at the large pilgrimage upon which we are all engaged. We're baptized into this pilgrimage. And this is the pilgrimage that we receive nourishment on the way through the preaching of the word and through the receiving of the sacraments. And so I pray that this preaching on pilgrimage will help people to understand who they are, the journey that they are undergoing, whether they realize it or not, and how Jesus is there to help them understand that they are fit by baptism and faith for the kingdom of God.